Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Nat Chat, where we are exploring what to do as a college student or recent graduate who's dissatisfied with the typical college track post-grad career options. In this episode, I'm joined by Nasus Papadopoulos, who actually attended Oxford University and then shortly after realized that the track he was on of finance and economics just really wasn't for him. He set out and took a long extended trip starting in Brazil to explore and see what he might be more interested in and eventually settled on focusing on meta-learning, learning how to learn, and started the site that he runs now, metalearn.net, where he educates other people who want to learn how to learn on strategies for self-education, uh, exploring new topics, developing new skills. And he's also got a popular podcast and course on the topic, all focused on helping people get better at learning. We talked a lot about things he has learned from working with different people on learning how to learn. Uh, we're going to say the word learn a lot in this show and uh, really dug deep on some of the more niche, finer aspects of learning that I was thinking listeners like you probably hadn't heard of before. So we had a lot of fun talking about this. I learned some new things. I'm sure you will too. And without further ado, let's bring Nasus on the show. Nasus, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to this week have you on my show. It's going to be fun. Likewise, man. Yeah, enjoying to uh, get to con- kind of complete the other side of the trade now, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I feel like uh, these interviews, they're always so one-sided. So I learn a ton about the guest, but then we never get to actually have a conversation. But now we've done both sides. So this will be a lot of fun. For sure, man. Looking forward to it. And I thought the best way for us to open was to toss your own question at you, which is, what was school like for you? Mm. So when I kind of look back on my my educational experience, I can kind of separate it into a couple of main phases. So um, growing up here in the UK and London, what we call primary school, what you guys would call elementary school, I was the best at everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was top of my class in pretty much every subject. I was the best sportsman. I was the popular kid. And like everything was awesome, man. I really, really, I enjoyed being at the top of the hierarchy, so to speak, in that time. And I look back on it with like a lot of fondness. Um, so, But when I was about 13, um, we take an exam here in the UK to go to secondary school what you guys, I believe, were called middle school um, to go to a secondary school. And this school was much bigger. It was super competitive. And I kind of went from being a big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a big pond. So from the age of about 13 to 15, starting out in this new school in a completely different environment, I found it tough because I was no longer the best at everything, right? I wasn't the best sportsman. Um, first of all, I played football or as you guys would call it, soccer. And I was pretty good at that in elementary school. And then at this school, they played rugby and rowing. OK, and I hadn't done any of those. So that piece was kind of taken away. And then in terms of classes, I was no longer top of the class in everything. I was always pretty good at languages. So I still tended to do pretty well in those. But now I was kind of like middling to average in most classes. And to be perfectly honest, I found that pretty hard to deal with, certainly over those first couple of years. Um, it was kind of a bit of a shock to the system. And I found it kind of hard to adapt because my whole identity had been wrapped around being the best at everything. Right. But anyway, over the course of that kind of um, those kind of the next few years, I kind of worked through and started to improve both academically and in other areas as well. Ended up applying to study economics and management at Oxford, which was a pretty rigorous interviewing process and applications process. Um, for me, it was kind of like the pinnacle, like I've always been super competitive, right? And so I've always wanted to, as you can probably guess from the earlier stories to win at everything. And for me getting into Oxford and studying economics and management, which is the most competitive course there, that was my idea of winning. And so I was pretty determined to get there. And I did, which kind of takes us on to this third part of my educational experience, which was university, right? Now, when I got to university, first of all, I realized that the kind of brute force learning that I've been using to kind of do pretty well in school up to that point. Um, I'd more or less always been a straight A student other than in a couple of different areas, but I'd always done well, even though, as I was saying, I wasn't necessarily the best in kind of high school and middle school. And I kind of was a little bit shocked at that when I got to university. I also was not super engaged, to be honest, because I was doing the course for a very instrumental reason, right? It was the objective of winning. 
And I also had in the back of my mind from when I was 17, 18, that I wanted to go into finance. Like that was also my idea of success. So while I was at university, the first two years, I had a pretty good time, did well enough in classes to get by without sort of super extending myself, but was kind of asking myself, uh, to be honest, all the way through, like, is this it? Like, is, is this, you know, I felt like I'd sort of done what I wanted to do, but it didn't seem to kind of feel right. And then in my summers, I was doing internships in investment banks, and I was kind of getting the same feeling. So then I guess to wrap up the story, finals came around, which was in my third year. And in my course on economics and management, basically all of the mark for the entire course was in finals because the first year was just pass fail to get to second year. Second year, we didn't have exams. So it was basically eight exams in 10 days and all of the degree was on that. <laughs> so needless to say, I worked like an animal for like um, the, I would say a good sort of like four to five months. I was working like an absolute machine leading up to those exams. And it was by far and away one of the most difficult times of my life because I kind of blocked everything else out. I stopped socializing. I stopped playing sports. I stopped doing the things that I enjoyed. And, you know, people were saying, you know, what are you doing? Maybe you're taking this too far. But I was just determined that I was going to get a top grade in that. Now, as it turned out, when results came through at the end of the summer, and I actually found out while I was doing an internship in an investment bank, I missed out on the top grade by two marks. And that completely man, that completely changed my perspective on everything. At first, it was anger and frustration. And why did I just waste the last kind of four or five months of my life killing myself when my friends were out having fun and they basically ended up getting more or less the same mark as me? And it was a tough time. It was a tough time. But looking back, it was a very, very important moment because it made me question the entire mindset that I'd really had throughout school. And it made me ask questions like, what does it mean to actually win? Like, who's setting the parameters here? Who's defining what success looks like? And that, to be honest, really set up the next kind of five year period of my life, which has unfolded until this point right now. And so it was a pretty seminal experience. So I hope that wasn't too long and rambling, but that's kind of my broad experience and, and how I kind of reflect looking back on my time at school. And for US listeners, what does missing it by two marks mean? Is that like two letter grades or is it two points out of 100? How does that? It's two points out of 100. Yeah. Ouch. Okay. <laughs> In one exam. So there was one particular exam that I just uh, fought a little bit below on. So yeah, it was a heartbreaker at the time. But like I said, I think it ended up being a bit of a blessing. Yeah. And you said you were working at an investment bank at the time. So yeah. when you got this result, how did your perspective on continuing to work in finance change? Well, the funny thing is I've been getting a weird feeling the whole time I'd been in banking because I'd done a couple of internships, as I mentioned before, and it had never been quite right. So I was like, okay, maybe I need to change divisions. So I'd done investment banking division. I was like, oh, maybe I'll do sales and trading. You know, uh, I think I'd do well in like a, a faster paced environment and something still wasn't quite right. So getting that result made me start to question, like, what is that feeling? What don't you like about this? Maybe this isn't kind of the right fit for you. And I really started to kind of reflect on all of those feelings and pay attention to them. And what was the like next step that you took after that? Because this internship ended and you had your finals. So where did you go from there? Sure. So the internship ended. So I finished my finals in May. The internship was from June to August. So it was like a proper summer 10 week internship. And then at the end of that internship, the bank asked me to start straight away because they obviously knew that I'd graduated. And I told them that I uh, wanted to go and travel for a year. And would they still have the job for me if I came back in a year's time? And they said yes. But after I actually had a month to kind of just kind of jump off the treadmill and reflect on things and really kind of think about the experiences that I've been through. I just knew that that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I called them back up and I said, you know, I'm sorry, I said I was going to come back in a year, but I'm not coming back at all. <laughs> <laughs> Had you signed anything? Were you reneging on a contract or was it? In no, no, not at all. It, it was an informal agreement. I mean, they'd send me the contract, but I just hadn't, I hadn't signed it. So did you end up taking that whole year of travel? I did indeed. Yeah. I spent sort of the September to the December for me was like a bit of time trying to figure out what the hell I did want to do because obviously it was a bit of a U-turn and my whole plan up to that point had been kind of taking that path to finance. So I basically just started reading as much as I could possibly get my hands on. I started also just thinking about what experiments can I run with my career that will allow me to kind of test what I might be good at. So I freelance for a couple of startups doing different jobs. One was doing uh, sales for like this new special coffee company. 
Um, another one was being a part of a, a new recruitment startup and kind of doing the business development for them, but also kind of learning how the systems worked and doing a bit of marketing and, and other bits and pieces. Um, and then after those experiences, I went and I spent about four months traveling around Brazil, which is somewhere where I'd always wanted to go. And I taught myself kind of Portuguese before I went there. So I was at a decent level. I was able to speak the language. Always find that it's a much more valuable and rewarding experience when you go and visit a country and you can really throw yourself into the culture by speaking the language. I think the language helps you do that. And yeah, just had an awesome, awesome, like really formative experience traveling on my own in Brazil. And then after that experience came back to London and, uh, and started the process of figuring out what I was going to do next. How were you paying for everything while you were taking that long travel adventure so the good thing about the internship was they paid pretty well <laughs> uh, so you had some savings from that yeah and so i had a good amount of savings from that i'd also been making some money from uh from the freelance stuff that i was doing so i had a good chunk of money saved up and uh definitely spent a good portion of it during the travels as well <laughs> probably ended up being a good investment though i think it was in hindsight yeah for sure yeah. Do you remember what some of those books you were reading during that crazy phase from September to December that had a really big impact on your thinking? Mm, a few stand out. So uh, one of them was How Will You Measure Your Life by Clayton Christensen, um, Harvard Business School professor. And basically, the book kind of uses business case studies to kind of focus on really important big questions in life. And I just remember it's a very short book. Very simple, but something in it really, really resonated with me. And it was all about, you know, paying attention to these big questions that I didn't feel I had been paying attention to and should have been paying attention to sooner. So that made a really big impact. I'm trying to think back what else I read. So I was getting into entrepreneurship and a lot of different sort of thinkers in that field. So obviously I read the inevitable, you know, Tim Ferriss's four hour work week and stuff like that. And that opened up the possibility to me of sort of like building a, a location independent business uh, and a lifestyle business, et cetera. Um, was reading philosophy particularly like some of the ancient Greek thinkers who I'm a big fan of, uh, like Plato and Aristotle, really just as much as I could possibly get my hands on anything that I thought could help me solve the problem of, of what do I do with my life, which is a pretty broad remit, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what point did this start to congeal into MetaLearn, what you're working on now? Was it directly after all of your travels that you started on this project or were there other things in between? So pretty soon after that, I started to become more and more interested in the process of learning and picking up new skills because I realized, look, if I am going on this, if I'm going off on a different path here to what I've I'd imagined I would be on, one thing I know for sure is that I'm going to have to learn a lot of new stuff. So that combined with the fact that I started working as a as a private tutor, like teaching college students here in London, um, meant that I became really interested in the learning process because I was like, well, look. Um, this is going to be super transferable for me in terms of me picking up new skills. Hopefully I can implement it into uh, also hopefully creating some interesting lessons for students. And so I sort of dived into the research on neuroscience, cognitive psychology. Started re This is when I really started reading a lot of books around learning as well and slowly started deciding to sort of document my thoughts in terms of articles on the blog, which was the early form of MetaLearn. And then a couple of years ago, that turned into a podcast where uh, I've been interviewing thought leaders about teaching, learning, and just really living in a self-directed and autonomous way ever since. Yeah. What have been some of the biggest surprises or interesting lessons that you've learned from digging so deep into how to learn? It's funny, you know, the things that I've learned really sound extremely simple and obvious, but I think some of the most... and. To be honest, that's something I've seen also in some of the interviews that I've done with a lot of people who have been thought leaders in their fields is that the most important truths are often very simple when you articulate them, but there's a lot more there. So in terms of the learning process, I think one thing that I've just come back to again and again and again, and I found it so often, is how important finding meaning in something is. And I don't think this just applies to learning projects. I think it applies to everything that you do in your life. But the difference in uh, because ultimately the techniques and the efficient learning processes are very important. But if you're applying it to something that you don't really want to learn, that doesn't really have meaning to you, you're kind of missing a trick in the sense that, you know, it's that whole piece of being efficient rather than being effective. It's, you know, as opposed to choosing the right thing to do, you might be doing the wrong thing, but you're doing it well. 
So that whole piece about meaning and the way it affects motivation and someone's desire to solve the problems that inevitably come up when you're trying to learn something new is extremely important. And I found it, it's been there with pretty much everyone that I've spoken to who, who has completed any meaningful learning project. Um, I think another kind of important piece to understand as well is um, without being, and I certainly don't consider myself to be an expert in cognitive science or neuroscience, but I have read research and I have spoken to some of the really top thinkers in those spaces. Um, I think it's extremely important to have a basic understanding of how the brain works for a number of different reasons, but especially for learning. I mean, this is stuff that I have no idea why it doesn't get taught in school, but understanding the understanding, for instance, of things like neuroplasticity, you know, and the implications of that, that it is actually possible through deliberate practice to change the structure of your brain and to change your behaviors when so many people more or less just tend to accept the fact that they are the way they are more or less forever. Another important sort of finding in terms of how we learn is Hebb's law, right? And the fact that we learn effectively when we make connections between different things, whether that's other things that we've learned before, personal experiences, because that's the way our brain works. Our brain works through connections. And if you understand that, then you can obviously tailor your learning in a way that, that builds on that and makes you far more likely to, to retain and apply what you've learned effectively. Um, and I guess the third and final piece really would be self-awareness, metacognition, right? Uh, so again, a lot of research has been done into this recently and a lot of great findings have been found, but this isn't really news. I mean, if you go back to most ancient traditions, there's a piece about self-awareness and being aware of, of yourself uh, in almost all of them. But again, I think it's so important from a decision-making perspective, from uh, that first piece of choosing something that's really meaningful to you as well. So those would be the, the main things. On that point of neuroplasticity, how similar is that to this idea of the growth mindset versus fixed mindset? Can you talk about that a bit? Sure, absolutely. So um, Carol Dweck, uh, Stanford psychologist and neuroscientist, basically separated people in our experiments into two categories. Uh, the growth mindset, where people essentially have a belief that they can change and improve, uh, and a fixed mindset where people more or less believe that their abilities are set in stone. So where that ties in with neuroplasticity is obviously if you believe that you are capable of changing uh, and you have a growth mindset, you will try to learn new things. You will expose yourself to different experiences. And as a result of that, you will enjoy the benefits of neuroplasticity, which will be a change in your perceptions and a change in your actions. Right. Whereas somebody who has a fixed mindset would be, well, they just wouldn't expose themselves to those new experiences, they wouldn't learn new things as a result of the belief that they couldn't, right? Right. But you've also said that the growth mindset is kind of harmful for learning, right? So how does that factor in here? Sure. So I think I think it's harmful in a couple of different ways. So it's important to, and there's a lot of rhetoric around this at the moment as well, is this kind of anyone can do anything type uh, attitude, right? Which I think is really important to examine because I think a lot of the time, or up till recently, I think, a lot of people's biggest problem has been having that fixed mindset, not believing that they are capable of learning new things, of doing new things. But I think one thing that's happened as a result of uh, our greater exposure to success uh, massively through the internet and media, et cetera, is that now everybody thinks they should be Elon Musk or everybody thinks they should be a world beater. And if they're not, they're a failure. And I think as a result, people sometimes develop uh, overly high expectations for what they can achieve in a short period of time. And look, I believe that, you know, most people can achieve remarkable things if they apply themselves over long periods of time. And it's usually stuff that most people aren't even capable of imagining themselves. I genuinely believe that. But I think it's super important to not take this idea of a growth mindset to, to not take it too literally and to not apply it in every single context. Because if you believe that you can change and that change is as easy as believing it, <laughs> you're going to be in for uh, some bad surprises because change is hard and change takes a long time and uh, it's not easy and there are ups and downs and it's not as easy as just flicking a switch, right? It takes consistent action in the real world and a fundamental change in your behavior to actually make proper change and to achieve those things that you are capable of achieving. So I think that's my kind of view on the growth mindset it should be very much taken with a caveat and applied to your specific context. So what would be an intelligent way to use it if somebody is struggling with something, say language learning? You've talked about that a bit before. Mm, okay. So I mean, look, there's a couple of different pieces here. So 
if a lot of people, uh, it's certainly common in the UK and the US is that everybody speaks English, right? And uh, they're very monolingual cultures. So it's extremely uncommon for people to speak more than one language fluently. Of course, everybody gets taught like French or Spanish in high school, but it's usually taught so badly that they completely forget it. And then, you know, maybe they remember a few words when they actually leave school. So in the context of, of, of kind of like these kind of more English speaking audiences, a very common limiting belief that people will have will just be, you know, I'm not any good at languages. I'm not capable of learning another language. That's obviously uh, an instance of the fixed mindset, right? Where you're, you're limiting yourself and your capabilities. You know, taking a growth mindset approach would obviously be saying, you know, I am capable of doing it. And the important thing to actually materialize that in the real world would be to take some quick action, get a couple of quick wins to prove to yourself that you're not just giving yourself the spiel about you're capable of doing anything. You know, it's so important to then take that action to book a first lesson with a, you know, a language tutor on italki to, um, you know, to buy a beginner's textbook, to start listening to an audio program. You know, of course, I can talk more if you're interested in like the best ways to learn a language. But more important than that, uh, and certainly in the context of the growth mindset and beliefs and habit formation is just getting started in the first place. How much of a factor do you think IQ is? Have you done much research on that? Mm, so I can't say I've done extensive research into it. I have read a couple of books on the subject and I have spoken to a psychologist called Richard Nisbet. Oh, okay, yeah. From the University of Michigan, who's uh, written an excellent book on it called Intelligence and How to Get It. And this obviously ties into the discussion that we're having here in terms of, you know, to what extent are, first of all, a couple of questions. One, is IQ really a good measure of intelligence? And second, you know, what exactly is intelligence in the first place? Because obviously it's the definition is extremely important. And then a third extended version of that question is obviously how plastic is the intelligence, right? To what extent is it something that's within our control? Now, based on the conversations that I've had and the reading that I've done, and again, you know, don't take my word for anything. My views on the subject are kind of as follows. I think we obviously there is a genetic component to intelligence that there's absolutely no doubt about that. Anyone who has ever taught very young children will be able to observe that phenomenon. Some some people might come back and say yes, but to what extent is that a construction of their environment? For me, it's pretty it's almost it's extremely hard to dispute the fact that there are hereditary differences in intelligence. That's not to say, obviously, going back to this idea of the growth mindset, that it's not possible to develop that. Now in terms of the question of IQ, I think that uh, it's gotten a lot of flack in recent years. And I understand why. Because IQ measures a certain kind of intelligence, right? It measures analytical intelligence. It measures our ability to solve specific kinds of problems. It is by no means a universal measure of somebody's ability to operate within an environment, which is a broader definition of intelligence, right? And this is where the piece about multiple intelligences and the work of people like Howard Gardner comes into play, which is, you know, IQ and the way that we traditionally judge whether someone is uh, an intelligent person in our society is a very limited way of doing it. And people have different kinds of intelligences. Um, if we're talking about analytical intelligence, though, I think IQ up to this point is the best thing that we've got as a standardized test. And obviously, every single standardized test is limited in nature. And it's very, very important to acknowledge the constraints and the limits of it. Um, however, if you are looking to measure it, I think up to this point, IQ is the best thing that we've got. How would you define intelligence? Would you go with that sort of ability to operate in the world definition that you mentioned before? Or how do you normally think about it? I would go with that broader definition. Yeah, because I think it is much more, I think it's more practical. I think it's more practical. And ultimately, what matters to all of us is our ability to operate in our environment so that we can live a, you know, a happy and fulfilled life doing things that matter to us. Um, with people that we enjoy spending time around. And so as a result, I think that broader definition is much more accurate. Look at how many successful and happy people there are who are not analytically intelligent. You know, they may be extremely creative in certain fields and have huge flaws in others. But it's an understanding of those strengths and weaknesses, which I think allows you to operate in your environment. So I think uh, for me, intelligence is a much more multifaceted component than just that piece. Yeah. And what do you or have you done anything around figuring out those strengths and weaknesses? Because yeah, I, I totally agree with you that it is a more nuanced thing than just our intelligence is more nuanced than just a simple number on a scale. It's a component, but it's not the whole picture. And everyone does have certain strengths and weaknesses. So have you done anything around learning what 
yours are or helping other people figure out what theirs might be? Sure, absolutely. It's a big piece of the sort of first section of my course, Make Me a Metal, I know which I go into it in depth there. But I've done it a lot personally as well, and I have done it with others. I think there are a couple of pieces here. The first one is doing your own self-reflection, right? So again, super simple, just finding the time to sit down and really try and as objectively as possible, consider what your strengths and weaknesses are and then go back and try and find specific episodes in your life where you found that you demonstrated those, right? Because if there's no, if you think that you're super self-aware or you think that you are very extroverted and an excellent salesman and you go back through your past and you can't find any instances of where that happened, <laughs> that may be, an, that may be a, a piece of evidence that you're not who you think you are, right? Um, the second thing is uh, I actually came across a really excellent resource for this um, from Jordan Peterson, the psychologist who's sort of become a lot more prominent on the internet recently as a result of being involved in various political discussions. But he has something called the self-authoring suite, right? Which is basically a form of self-analysis, which would be familiar with most people. And basically what I did was I kind of printed out those documents and I gave it to my mum and to my sister. This is something I did recently, but I've done it in the past. And I kind of asked them to, and to a close friend as well, I asked them to fill it in as objectively as possible and try and reflect back to me who they saw that I was. Because I think that objective perspective is so, so important because you know, but sometimes you can play tricks on yourself. So in terms of those strengths and weaknesses, it's super important to have your own perspective with evidence and other people's perception of you. And then I would have a short conversation with my mom, my sister and my friend about it and say, OK, you know, where do our opinions diverge? Where is this coming from, et cetera, et cetera. Now, hopefully I'm on very good terms. I should note with my with my mom, and my sister. And so they're not afraid to call me out on things and to say things that I might not want to hear. And my close friend as well. It may, they may, family may not always be the best people to do that. It may be better to go to friends because, you know, relationships can be complicated. But those have really been the main two things for me. What's my perspective of myself and what's the people who spend a lot of time with me's perspective of myself? Yeah, I love that. It's so hard to accurately view ourselves for all the reasons you alluded to, which is just we have all these biases and heuristics about our own behavior and this narrative fallacy, and we tend to view ourselves in this really positive, self-promoting light. It's probably why that advice that you can give yourself better advice by imagining what advice you'd give to a friend usually helps because we're always way more generous with our own situations <laughs> than we would be with others. For sure. Does Peterson recommend that having other people fill it in or is that something you came up with? That's some, I'm pretty sure that's something I came up with. Yeah. Nice. Um, because he stresses how important it is for you to reflect on your own behaviors and characteristics because he really wants to put the emphasis on the individual to think for themselves and try and examine themselves as objectively as possible. And I think that is essential. But I just thought, hey, you know, wouldn't it be good if uh, people who've known me since I was born <laughs> gave me some sort of feedback on this stuff as well? And it was really interesting because there were a couple of areas where, you know, I was just reminded of things. It's important to be sometimes, you know, most of this stuff you already know, but being reminded of it and then reflecting on perhaps where you can improve in your life is, is a really, really important piece of this. Do you mind sharing what some of those surprises were? Sure. I'm just thinking back now to there was one big one where I remember. I, so the story that I mentioned before where I was saying, you know, um, you think that you have this trait and then you look back and you realize that there isn't really any instance of it or there isn't as much instance of it as you would like to see. So one of the so here's one that it was actually the self-awareness piece, funnily enough. So I put one of my strengths was understanding myself and others. Right. And what I actually realized is that the very fact that I was doing that exercise was a reflection that not that it was a weakness, but it certainly wasn't a strength. Like, because when I went to go and write a story or find stories where I had shown a great understanding of myself or a great understanding of others, I was kind of searching for stuff. It was funny because I was like trying to force a story and it just wasn't coming. Right. And I was like, man, I was, there was definitely resistance. I was annoyed because I was like, man, you know, I've really been working on the self-awareness thing. I think um, I understand myself a lot better than I did before. But it, it was very funny because it made me reflect on my sister is somebody who has never in her life done an exercise like this. But she has always been uh, kind of calmly confident about the path that she was taking in life, not really worrying about uh, what other people were doing and just always had a kind of fundamental understanding of who she was and what she was good at. And she'd never had to do an exercise like this. So it just pointed out to me how there is no one size fits all. 
And I felt and feel like I need to do this kind of work because certainly in the past, and obviously still there are things that I need to work on. I have not been as aware of myself as I could have been. So that was a super interesting finding. Yeah. So in the spirit of MetaLearn then, what have you been doing to learn to be more self-aware and other aware? Just dedicating more time to the process of reflecting on what I'm doing and what I'm thinking. So I have kind of journaled on and off over the course of the last four or five years, um, but I've now made it a much more deliberate practice. So I am uh, journaling at the start and end of every day and just kind of recording my thoughts reflecting on what I did that day, what I did well, what I could do better. And I found that to be really, really powerful. Um, The consistency of the practice, because notice before I was saying I've been doing it on and off. I think with many of these things, the same, I think, goes for meditation. The same, I think, goes for many other things is it's the consistency over a long period of time where you really start to see the breakthrough because most of these processes are quite nonlinear. And I think self-knowledge is a a very nonlinear process. Are you using a five minute journal or anything for that? Or is it free form? Uh, it's free form. So I just use a nice moleskin notebook. So I usually buy quite a few of those at a time. And I find it's nice to write on nice paper in nice notebooks with a nice pen. It creates a certain ritual around the activity, which uh, in my mind, at least makes it feel more important, makes it feel more significant. And that's great because it is, it's super important and it's super significant. And so Spending some money on a nice pen and some Moleskine notebooks is probably one of the best investments I'll ever make if it means I become more self-aware as a result. I love it. Going back a little bit to what you were talking about with what people get wrong about learning or sort of what surprised you, uh, you brought up this idea of it's Hebb's law, right? Am I saying that right? Yes. Yeah. How you tie things together and you know you kind of build knowledge on past knowledge. How have you done that in your own life or what are some good examples of doing that? Because I haven't heard the term before. So, yeah, so just to just to sort of reiterate what you said, Hebb's law um, states that neurons that fire together wire together. And so what that means is that basically when you connect one piece of information to another piece of information, a connection is formed between those two pieces of information. So when you remember one thing, it's linked to the other thing. And so the memory strengthens and that pathway is reinforced. So the more things you know that are connected to each other, the better you are capable of retaining and applying those ideas, those pieces of information. Um, How do I apply or how have I applied Hebb's law? I would kind of say that I'm applying it all the time, every day, everywhere, as much as possible. Because as soon as I come across something that I don't know, I try everything I can to link it back to a previous experience or something that I'm doing at the moment or something that I've read in an attempt to kind of, first of all, kind of create a bit of a scaffold so I can kind of get my head around it and then obviously have the benefits of connecting it to other stuff, right? Um, Perfect example is actually just today. I was talking to uh, a friend of mine who is a programmer and he was explaining to me the fundamental principles of Python, the programming language. Uh, The reason I wanted to learn about this was because I'm currently working with a client who purchased the the version of my course that has coaching sessions who wants to learn Python. And so obviously I'm coaching her. I'm sort of operating as as a learning coach for her and helping her through the process of setting up systems, but I'm not a Python expert. And so I wanted to, uh, I've been trying to learn as much as I possibly can about it so I can give good contextual advice and as necessary, refer to her to an expert for the kind of technical things. So my friend Carlo was explaining to me the kind of the process of how Python works. And he was talking to me about variables and programs. And the analogy I kind of drew to it was um, just a simple input process output model that I've often used for thinking about how to learn new skills. So I just drew a parallel to something I thought about before. And obviously, funnily enough, that parallel clearly is drawn from a computer analogy in the first place. But it was the way he was explaining it that I was able to connect it to that. So, um, yeah, the short answer to your question is everywhere all the time as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, this is sort of a, a tangent, but I saw it on your blog as well, and I wanted to go a little bit deeper on it, which is uh, this gamification of learning. Yes. I've always been a little critical of it because I think there are some harms that come with it. Uh, and I wanted to hear your perspective on these gamified learning platforms like Duolingo, Codecademy, and even on you know the much younger scale like Sesame Street, which is sort of the original version of this. Mm. 
Yeah, I think gamification is such an interesting, uh, it's a very interesting space, a very interesting phenomenon because it gets at something very fundamentally human about us, which is that we like to have fun. We like to play. And that play drive is something that is innate in all of us. And you see it in animals as well, but it's a, it's it's innate in all of us. We want to have fun, right? Um, what gamification does is it essentially tries to create an objective that we want to reach, right? And then make the process of getting there as fun as possible by rewarding us as we make progress along the way. I think it can be useful for some people in certain contexts. For instance, if you're having a lot of resistance to learning a language, I personally don't like using Duolingo and Memrise, but in the spirits of getting stuff done and starting somewhere, I much prefer you to get the quick win of learning a few basic sentences and words and verbs in the language that you're learning by using those apps. But I think there's something a little bit missing from this whole kind of space of gamification, which is that um, it's kind of trying to disguise the fact that there's a process involved in learning something, you know, and that that process is not always fun. You know, sometimes it is hard. Sometimes it is boring. Sometimes you don't want to sit down and read that book. Sometimes you don't want to get on Skype and have that conversation with your language teacher. Sometimes you don't want to pick up the guitar and learn that new song. And what gamification does is I think it tries to cover that over. And what I find is that whenever I've used those apps, eventually I just get bored of it and it starts to seem pointless. And I think part of that is because you're not accepting the ups and downs of the process. So I think when you become conscious of that and you start to say, you know what, this is just part of the process and today might be a down day, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to show up. Plus the value and the reward and the pride that you get when you show up when you didn't want to is 10 times what you feel when you were in a good mood and you did it anyway. And I think gamification kind of, um, it shields us almost from enjoying those kind of like those down moments and doing it anyway. So those are my kind of my initial thoughts on it. Yeah. So what do you think is a good way to blend the effective with the games, right? So Duolingo is probably not something that you want to rely on for your language education, but how do you fit those tools into what you would see as a more effective learning process? Sure. So I think, again, depends always on the context and on the subject. But I think if you have a piece of your learning process that is purely gamified, that's great, as long as it's not the only thing, right? Another thing I would say as well is, you know, what's stopping you from working gamification to the process of learning something in other ways? You know, the way that you approach it. And again, this sounds very soft and fuzzy, but it is so important is like, how are you framing this project? How are you framing what you're doing? If I go and practice, I'm learning the bazooki at the moment, which is like a Greek mandolin. Cool. It just sounds just amazing. It's so, so good. If anyone hasn't heard of the bazooki, uh, type bazooki music into YouTube and you just find some awesome stuff. But anyway, like if I frame that as like work that I have to do when I get up in the morning or before I go to bed at night, if, if I'm doing that, that's just something that another thing that I have to do obviously then it becomes like boring and not fun and I'm probably going to give up soon. But if I frame it in my head as a game, like, can I get good enough at this song that I can kind of play it around my family over Christmas time? Like then it kind of becomes fun. And then if I tell them that I'm going to be able to play that song and they're like, no way you can't play that. You just started learning it. Like I like the challenge. Now it's fun. Now there's kind of a, a gamified process to it in a sense, but I'm creating it myself through my perception rather than having the kind of artificial need to have it stimulated and have that reward. Um, although I would caveat this with, look, it is important to understand that we need reward and we need praise. And you need to consider that when you're learning anything is you need the feedback loops of success. So feeling like you're getting those wins, right? Otherwise, it's just a long, boring, drawn out process. So these are all really important things to consider, I think, when you're, you're thinking about how do I have fun, but still make sure that I enjoy the process. Yeah, well, on that note, how do you keep yourself motivated in general? So both with these things that you're trying to learn, but then also working on your own on this entrepreneurial creative project? Sure. I, it comes down to meaning for me that, again, if I have a very clear understanding of why I'm doing something and why it matters in the moments when I feel like I don't want to do it, when I don't want to show up, when I have those dips like we all do inevitably – I come back to why am I doing this? Why does this matter to me? What impact is this having on the people around me, you know, on the wider world? And that keeps me motivated. It's not 
for me, like, you know, in the past, God, when I was studying for finals, man, I used to listen to all sorts of motivational stuff to keep me in the <laughs> library. Like I was, I needed it, you know, I needed it. But that's because I was doing something that I hadn't, I didn't really know why I was doing it. I was doing it because I thought that was winning the game, right? And what I found as I've sort of uh, learned new things and, you know, worked on MetaLearn is that when it has meaning to you, the other motivation stuff just becomes almost irrelevant. You know, there are always times when you might need to pick me up or, you know, you might need your friend to kind of give you a kick up the ass or you might need to watch a motivational video, but kind of flicking through like motivational quotes on Twitter or Instagram or YouTube, if you need to do that on a regular basis, you're doing the wrong thing. And I think that's something that I see a lot of. Yeah, it's such an interesting problem because I feel like a lot of people are stuck in something that they don't love, but that they are they've pre-committed themselves to. And what's interesting in your story kind of stands out is that you had put in all of this effort, right, going down this finance route and, you know, working so hard to get into college and working so hard to get the degree. And I imagine you had to work hard for the internship too, but you were able to move away from that. You were able to kind of let go of the sunk cost. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. I've definitely seen people really struggle with that. Was anything helpful with you for letting go of that effort that you had already put in and trying to find something else? There were a couple of things, um, some of which I don't think are <laughs> replicable or transferable. One was the intensity, but some of which are. The one that's not replicable or transferable, unless you somehow try and engineer it, but it's not going to work that way, is the intensity of, uh, of missing out on the top grade in my finals, right? That was a real wake-up call because it was basically like a giant sort of like billboard in front of my face saying what you're doing isn't working right like the approach of just killing yourself working in order to get success isn't working so question it but what i think is replicable and transferable in terms of like getting over sunk cost investments is just giving yourself time and space to like reflect on what are you doing and why are you doing it and to remind yourself that, you know, most of the people listening to this podcast will be in their 20s or 30s. Like, we're going to live till most likely, you know, or many of us. Um, you've got all of your life left. You've just got started. Like, what sunk cost? I get it if you're like 50 and 60, but even then, that's not an excuse anymore, you know? What is this sunk cost that you've kind of built up in your head that you've invested time and energy in it? It's part of the process. If that's what you needed to get to where you are now and where you are now is not wanting to do the thing that you're doing, then you've got to start taking action to move away from that thing. And I'm not an advocate of if you don't have, uh, if you're not sort of in the right place financially, if you're not, if you don't have an immediate alternative of just taking a leap of faith and quitting your job with nothing there, right? That's what I did. And that was a difficult process adjusting and sort of like thinking, what do I do next? But it's keeping whatever you need to be stable, whether that's staying in a job or working something part time and then running as many experiments as you can to then figure out what it is that you do want to do. So the sunk cost fallacy in most cases is just that, like an absolute fallacy. And I see it so often as well now with a lot of people that I've known in the past who sort of said that you know, I've worked so hard, I'll do this for a year. And then the sunk cost fallacy just intensifies after that, because then you're even more tied in, right? Yeah, no, that's a great way of framing it, especially that full long term view, right? Sunk costs can seem so significant when you're just viewing what has already happened. But on the frame that you gave, which is that, well, if you're going to live to, you know, 120, 150, whatever, then you've actually invested a very small amount of time in this thing that you feel attached to. And since you brought up that long term horizon for thinking about this, what's your long term goal now with MetaLearn and what you're working on today? So, you know, I've, in the past, I've had MetaLearn has kind of evolved a lot over the last couple of years. And if you'd asked me this question a year ago, I would have had a very big, you know, grand, uh, ambitious plan to kind of uh, turn a large percentage of the world's population into independent thinkers and self-directed learners. Um, funnily enough, right now, I've kind of reframed that in my head. And I'm just more focused on doing good work every day that solves people's problems, that makes them think for themselves, that makes them able to take control of their learning. And whatever happens as a result of that, I believe will happen or I have faith in that, right? Um, I think showing up and doing the work every day 
and looking at yourself in the mirror at the end of the day and saying, you know, did I show up today? Like, did I really do the best I can do? I think if you put a lot of those days together over the course of a year or several years, then really great things can happen as a result. So I've tried to take this approach of detaching a little bit from the big, grand 10-year, 20-year, 50-year visions. Although, of course, that's not to say that I don't think about things or things that I would want to do. But I'm trying to focus a little bit more on just, you know, there are so many pieces and I've got some awesome plans for next year as well, which I won't go into yet. But I really, that's something I've tried to work on a lot because I think sometimes you can get too attached to that long-term vision. And very often what you do will change and it will morph in certain ways. And while it's very important to stay true to your principles, which I think you can do on a daily basis, the final outcome may change uh, and may look different to what you first envisaged it to be. So that's not a great answer to your question, but I hope it's it's moving it in the right direction. <laughs> No, I love that. And I think that it sounds kind of like a more systems approach to long-term thinking instead of just setting some arbitrary goal. And I think you know, Scott Adams talks about this and a number of other people, and it's a useful way of thinking, I find, on the long term of sort of like, what could you repeatedly do and generally move towards in the long term that would be happy and fulfilling? And it sounds like you've found a good area to focus on, which is great. And it's like bringing value and you're enjoying it and people are getting value from it as well. So it sounds like a very useful, enjoyable way of thinking on that longer term horizon. For sure, man. I want to pick up on something you said there, which is the systems thinking piece, which I think is so important. Whenever we're trying to make, you know, going back to what we were talking about before, uh, essentially any kind of form of progress that you want to make in life is a form of behavior change, right? You know, sometimes it may be a perspective shift, but usually that comes from taking action in the real world, et cetera. There's a feedback process. But anyway, I think we tend to think about things in a very reductive way most of the time, right? And we don't think about things, as you said, in systems, which is that uh, most things are, or many things, some things are not. If you pull lever A, product B might come out some of the time if it's a mechanical machine that works that way. But our lives, which are obviously the areas that most of us are most concerned about, it's our daily experience, are not like that. They cannot be uh, usually problems that we have are usually a little bit more complex than that, which is why when you're looking to learn something new or start a new behavior, you have to think about how that's going to fit into your existing life. You know, there are constraints, which is you and your current life. And so you need to understand the different things at play there, because it may not be possible to do a million things at once. It may not be possible to start this new creative project while you're also trying to experiment with a new diet and start learning a new musical instrument and all these other different bits and pieces. Here's a practical example of that from my life in, you know, just last year. At the start of last year, I set myself a project. I wanted to learn Spanish and Mandarin together, and I wanted to do that while continuing to tutor, which has been my uh, my sort of like uh, my side gig or my money earner over the last few years, and also do another uh, a number of other projects and obviously write consistently, do podcasts for MetaLearn uh, and grow that. Um, obviously, that was extremely naive because it didn't take into account uh, it wasn't a systems view of of like my life and the, the things that were going on uh, at that time. It was a very arbitrary I'm going to do these things, therefore I'm going to do them. I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to put the uh, slots in the calendar. I'm going to set the lessons. And if I do that, then it will just work. And when I started doing it, obviously it was taking away from other things. While I was doing Mandarin, I was like, man, but I'm doing really well on Spanish and I'm really enjoying it. Uh, when I was doing Spanish, I was like, oh, I'm feeling guilty about not doing so much Mandarin. And, you know, that was also detracting from other things. So it's just not Change is hard, just to go back to it. Change is hard because our lives are complicated. And if you understand that your life is a system that is influenced by what you're doing during the day, who you're spending time with, you know, something that you've been doing recently is, you know, experimenting with diet, what you eat, so important. Um, all of that stuff is so, so important. And so very simple reductive advice often leads to failure. I think that's a great note that we can go ahead and wrap up on. So Nasos, this was a lot of fun and it was nice to get to turn it around this time. If people want to dive deep on MetaLearn and all of your stuff, where is the best place that they should go? Sure. They can go to the homepage of my site, metalearn.net. That's M-E-T-A learn.net. Um, they can find me on Twitter at MetaLearn1. Uh, my personal handle is at NASPAP3, N-A-S-P-A-P-3. 
and yeah, if you just search for my name or you search for MetaLearn into Google as well, you'll find a bunch of stuff there. Um, so those are the main places to to check. Perfect. And we'll be sure to include all of that in the show notes. And yeah, thanks again for coming on, man. This was a lot of fun. I definitely picked up a few new things about meta learning, which is always enjoyable. And I've got a couple books to check out too. So we'll be sure to link to all of that so everyone has it and link to you as well, of course. And yeah, thanks again for coming on and we'll, uh, we'll talk more online. Thanks so much for having me, man. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of NatChat. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe to NatChat in iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Second, if you're trying to take advantage of some of the information from this episode, be sure you check out the show notes at nataliason, N-A-T-E-L-I-A-S-O-N dot com slash podcast. And find a friend, because implementing a lot of this stuff is much easier if you have somebody to do it with. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode and you've been enjoying other episodes of the podcast, please leave it a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your casts so that more people can find it. This is the best way for it to get some more exposure and to make sure that I can keep bringing these episodes to you. With that, thank you and have an awesome rest of your day.